This is David Osteen, pastor of Hope Bible Church in Jackson, Georgia, and I want to deal with a question concerning Ephesians 4, verse 8, which says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, of course, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. The question is, what does this mean, he led captivity captive? Now, when you look at this verse in context of what Paul's talking about, it's going to bring up a lot of other questions, but the point in this video is to focus in on he led captivity captive. I mean, here in the passage, he's talking about giving gifts, and he's talking about gifts to the body of Christ. Let's go ahead and read down further. Now, here's a parenthetical uh, remarks here in verse 9 and 10. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, and he gave some. So talking about these gifts, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, for, for what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So obviously he's quoting here, wherefore he saith, he's quoting from Psalm 68. We'll turn back there in a moment and read from there. But he's applying this spiritually to the body of Christ because obviously Psalm 68 is not talking about the body of Christ. That was a mystery hidden God first revealed to the Apostle Paul. As he says here in Ephesians 3, right here in this context, makes that crystal clear. So um, he's making an application. This is a spiritual application, which is permissible. I know some think it's you're not a right divider if you ever make an application of anything. Look, first establish sound doctrine in the right interpretation, but there are secondary spiritual applications that can be made so long as you're not violating sound doctrine and you make it clear it's an application. And this is obviously an application that Paul's making when you compare it back to Psalm 68. So uh, he he's talking about Christ giving gifts and apostles and prophets. Those offices are no longer needed. Nobody is an apostle today or a prophet today. We have the complete word of God. Uh, nobody's qualified to be an apostle today. Um, and we don't need prophets when we got the complete revelation of God in the scripture. And uh, that's another study for another time. Yes, there are still evangelists today and pastors and teachers. Uh, we need to do that work today uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But again, that's not really my point in this video. We want to focus in on he led captivity captive. So back in Psalm 68, you know, the Bible is a self-interpreting book. Uh, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. It's not our place to interpret the scripture. We don't need to try to interpret it, and we don't need to rely on some other man to try to interpret it. Interpretations belong to God, uh, Joseph said. And, and so, look, uh, God wrote the book in such a way that the Bible defines itself. When we compare spiritual things with spiritual, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2, that's a major key to Bible study, the words of God are spiritual words. When we compare scripture with scripture, uh, other passages shed light on what we're studying. And so we compare and we need to rightly divide. When we make the comparison, the things that are different, we leave them different. We rightly divide the word of truth. And so the word of God, as we study it with a believing heart, relying on the spirit of God, we can know the things of God and we can um, just, it's amazing. The more I study the Bible, how it opens up to me as I study it with a believing heart, rightly dividing it, it interprets itself. And uh, so it's a wonderful thing. So when we look at this, he led captivity captive, what does that expression mean? Well, it's used elsewhere in the scripture. Um, but let's go to where he's quoting in Psalm 68. He's quoting in verse 18. But it says in verse number 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Uh, the Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts from men. Now there, there's a, a change here. Nobody has the right today to change the word of God. But Paul wrote the word of God. He wrote it by inspiration. In Psalm 68, 18, it said, receive gifts from men. In Ephesians 4, verse 8, it said, he gave gifts unto men. Well, maybe they go together. He received the gifts to give the gifts. But the point is, Paul's making an application because it's not talking about the body of Christ in Psalm 68. It's talking about Israel being blessed in their kingdom, the victory, the conquest 
um, how the Lord is going to judge his enemies. He's going to save his nation. They're going to be blessed in their kingdom. Uh, he said, yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. Okay. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. So when God saves the nation Israel, he's going to bless them. He leads captivity captive. Israel had been captive. Now they're going to be victorious because of the Lord giving the victory, and they're going to rule over their oppressors. Okay, so it's a military term. Uh, back in Judges chapter number 5, uh, Judges 5, you have this song of victory. Uh, the Judges Deborah and Barak, uh, and you know I'm sure the context in Judges, the, the, the cycle of Israel rebelling, going into captivity or servitude to other nations, crying out to the Lord. The Lord delivers them and uh, sends a judge uh, to, to, to lead them out of captivity and out of servitude. And uh, then they, when that judge go, uh, dies or uh, they just go back in that same cycle again, it keeps repeating itself. In fact, it repeats itself uh, in the book of Judges as you study. You see it six times. That cycle is mentioned like that. It's clearly laid out six times. Six is the number of man. But um, in Judges 5, verse number 12, Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. And uh, we'll go ahead and read down the next verse. Uh, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. It's obviously military conquest back in chapter four of Judges. Uh, the, verse one, the children of Israel again did evil on the side of the Lord when Ehud was dead and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan and uh, so on. Verse three, the children of Israel cried to the Lord um, for he had 900 chariots of iron in 20 years. He mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Skip down to verse seven. I will draw unto thee to the river of Cason, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude. I will deliver him into thine hand. God's going to give him the victory. Verse 14, Deborah said to Barak, up for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand and so on. And so God gives the victory and they're singing about it and rejoicing in it. Led captivity captive. Uh, those who had been the captives are now in victory over their captors. Um, the captivity leads captive. In other words, their captors are now the ones in captivity and the tables have turned, so to speak. And so it's, it's you know, it's a military expression. It's got to do with victory. Another, another place, and there's a couple others, but time is fleeing away. Uh, let me just give you Isaiah 14. Um, Isaiah 14 it's not the exact expression, but it's similar and shed some light. Verse 1, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and with the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. They shall take them captives who, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Okay, let me read that again. They shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And I believe that's the same idea of leading captivity captive. So, Christ died on the cross for all of our sins. Praise the Lord for that. And he paid the price in full. The earth went dark three hours. He suffered the wrath of God on the sin of the world. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was made sin for us. He paid the sin debt in full on the cross of Calvary when he shed his blood and died on the cross. He was buried, but on the third day, he rose victorious over sin, death, and hell, and the devil. And then he was seen and made appearances over a period of 40 days, and then he, a public, he publicly ascended after that to heaven. And this ascension into heaven, what a wonderful thing uh, that, that was. I can, I can only imagine what the scene was like as he comes into heaven and he's victorious and he's accomplished 
what the Father sent him to accomplish. So many wonderful things we can think about and consider. But the point is this, that he is victorious, okay? And and I'm going to come back to this thing about him being in the heart of the earth for just a, for a moment here. But let me give you here in Ephesians, uh, again, verse 10, he descended, but he also ascended. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Okay, back in chapter 1 of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse number uh, 19, uh, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us were to believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And then uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Okay? He gave himself, and he died, and he was in the heart of the earth. But he triumphed. He spoiled principalities and powers. He is far above all, given a name above every name. And uh, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. And so he is victorious and he is ascended. He's at the right hand of the Father and he has spoiled principalities and powers. Satan and his evil uh, principalities and powers that work, spiritual wickedness in high places, all of that, he triumphed over them. He's victorious. There's so much to talk about along these lines. But led captivity captive is just saying that Christ is victorious. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil in his weakness in that he took on human flesh and died. Through that, he defeated the devil. Think of the power of God that he can take on flesh and die and through death defeat the devil. And he now has the keys of hell and of death. He went down the heart of the earth. He re resurrected and ascended up on high, and so he's victorious. That's the whole point of, of using that expression, he led captivity captive. Um, he was in the heart of the earth. Now, there are some people who want to map out everything that Jesus did for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth as though they know, and um, there's, there's mystery to that. I, I know that when he was on the cross, he told the thief who repented uh, today, uh, uh, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so uh, paradise was in the heart of the earth before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Everyone who died went to the heart of the earth. There was a torment section. There was a comfort section. There was a great gulf uh, betwixt the two. Christ talks about this for an example in Luke 16. And so Jesus went down into paradise the day he died. And he told that man, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So there's no soul sleep there. They're conscious. They're in paradise the day he died. And um, now people want to say, well, no, he had to go burn in hell to pay for our sins. I'm sorry, but Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. And for you to say that, no, he had to go burn in hell to do that is saying the cross was pointless, basically. He could have died any old way, so to speak, as long as he went down to hell because that's where he paid for our sins. No, he paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And I've got a message here on YouTube when I deal with this issue, did Jesus burn in hell? I know he went into the heart of the earth. I know it says, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. I talk about all of that. It's an hour-long message. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check that out. I've got an article also on our website that you can read on that if you're interested. And so I, I don't believe he was tormented. I, I, I believe he paid it all on the cross. And so... I don't think we can map it all out and understand every little detail of what happened, but we know he died on the cross. We know he was buried. He went to the heart of the earth. We know he rose the third day. We know that he ascended up on high, and he is victorious. And this issue of leading captivity captive, some will say what that means is the people that were in the heart of the earth, the Old Testament saints, he then took them to heaven. He led captivity captive means he took them to heaven. What well, That's not what it's talking about. Now, I, I do believe that the Old Testament saints are in, in heaven. I believe they were in the heart of the earth, and I believe they're now in heaven. I've got a video on that, question and answer number 90. 
And uh, Hebrews 12 talks about in heaven, um, who's present there, and it says the spirits of just men made perfect. And I believe that's in reference to those Old Testament saints. And, um, you know, people are going to try to say, well, no, uh, in Acts 2, Peter said David's not ascended up into heaven. He's talking about bodily ascension. Okay, that's what he's talking about in the context. He's saying what David wrote about had to do with Christ, not himself. And no, David's not bodily ascended into heaven, but his spirit is there. Okay, so I deal with that in Q&A number 90. So I don't believe that leading captivity captive is talking about emptying out the Old Testament saints from the heart of the earth and taking them to heaven. Although I do believe the Old Testament saints are in heaven, that's not what's being spoken of in Ephesians 4, 8. So sometimes people can teach the right thing using the wrong verses. And that's that's a hindrance. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Um so anyway, there's a lot that goes into all of that. Uh, people say, well, uh, the Old Testament saints' sins are not gone yet. Because in Acts 3, Peter said uh, you know, to Israel, repent that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, uh, which was before preached unto you, and so on, offering the kingdom to Israel. He's talking to uh, he's talking to Israel that rejected and crucified Christ. And he's calling on them to repent of that and that as a nation, their sins will be blotted out when he comes back under that new covenant. But to say the Old Testament saints were not blotted out uh, when Christ died on the cross or not forgiven, look, there, you got to understand the difference between national salvation and individual salvation. In 1 John, uh, the apostle John said, your sins are forgiven you. He said, I'm writing these things because your sins are forgiven you to the individual. And there are verses like that where, and I believe there's a context there to the tribulation saints, their sins individually are forgiven, but as a nation, they're not under the new covenant until the second coming of Christ. So you got to make that distinction so that the sins of the Old Testament saints were only covered uh, until Christ came and took them all away. And uh, in Romans chapter number three, I'm going longer. I'm looking at time here and this <laughs> we're past 17 minutes. I'm going longer than I intended, but let me give you Romans three and uh, Romans chapter three and verse number 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You know, God, God in his forbearance covered those sins in the Old Testament. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. It's by the blood of Christ they have the remission. Okay? So anyway, there's a lot, like I said, this is kind of one of those things where you're talking about lead captivity captive. There's a lot of other issues that can come up. But hopefully the video was helpful to you in regard to what it means to lead captivity captive. And, uh, you know, if you haven't already subscribed to this uh, channel, and uh, if you if you found this video to be helpful, then uh, why not give it a thumbs up? And if you have a question, you can send your questions to our website, hopebiblechurchga.com. Thank you for watching.